pulling the bearings off the pinion and carrier so I can replace those. I'm just using this uh, bearing removal tool. That's it, bearings off. And you can fight with these. You can get a little screwdriver back here or a punch or a chisel. Work on it. You can cut the race. You can do all kinds of things. There's a lot cheaper solutions, and I've done those too before, but getting a tool like one of these is definitely a big time saver. Especially and then these are just a little aluminum puck I've made for doing these. Just has a slight recess in it because the nipple on the carrier is going to stick up above the bearing when you're done. So you have to have something that goes presses on the the inner race. You don't want to press on the cage at all. There we go. You can see how that little nipple sticks right above the race cage. That's why you need something with a recess or a hollow middle in it. So now we'll go rebuild the inside. You know, it's time to put the differential back together and put all the clutch plates and spider gears in there. So this is the stack up I'm going with. My first plate on the gear is going to be a steel, then a friction, then two steels, a friction, a steel, a friction, and the shim. And the shims come in different thicknesses. This one's, for example, is a 30,000 shim. I'm using two 35,000 shims on mine. And when you measure your clutch pack, measure it this way. So with the shim, you want it right around 0.655. So I'm at 0.653, which is close enough. But if I had gone with the 30,000 shim, I'd be 5,000 less. So I'd be 648, which would be a little bit on the low side. So got my stack ups together. Everything's lubricated. We will slide all this together. You slide it in and lift it straight up into position. All right, you'll feel it go in, flip it over. And when you're sliding it in, you just want to wiggle it just a little bit to line up these clutch ears. All right, then that guy's in. We'll add a little bit of gear oil to the underneath of this wear plate. Kind of spread it around. Same with this guy. Slide these in, rotate it around, take a look down through the hole, make sure everything's lined up. Now for the fun part, the big spring. So the big spring is not easy to put in. And you can grab it with some vice grips and you can compress it some. I really don't like to do that because you could alter the shape and then you're losing your push out. So what I like to do, this point right here is the weakest part of the spring, which means if you push up on this piece, you can compress it the easiest. So I like to put this part up against the top gear, then try to compress this just enough to get it in there. Just like that. It's not too difficult. And then once it's in there and started, then you can straighten it out. Once you got everything lined up to where you think it's straight, and a good way to rotate it once the spring is in there is just to take something soft like the butt end of a rubber mallet, 
put it on the gears like this and then hammer the other end of the mallet and that'll just rotate one of the gears which will rotate all the gears in there. You're going to be fighting against the clutches so just take your time and don't hit anything with metal. And then once you're once you think you're all lined up slide your pin in and this is just to check it. It's a lot easier to adjust it now than it is once it's in the car. So everything lines up good. Now I'll put the ring gear on. So on the ring gear, it's important to make sure that this surface is extremely clean and flat. And some of the items that can be damaged on it are these holes. So if you look at this one right here, you can kind of see the edge is lifted up right at that bolt hole where it fractured a little bit. And this ring gear is good. I'm not worried about the ring gear itself, but there's a little bit of a lip there that I need to file down. Somebody might have over torqued it or when they installed this gear, they might have pulled it on with that bolt and it just damaged that thread a little. It's the only one like that, which is why I'm not too worried about this, but those are the kind of things that could come up which is why it's a good idea to file this. And also take a smaller flat file, hit this edge right here just in case. Feels pretty good. And we'll hit this guy with some heat. As soon as I drop it on, I'm going to put those three bolts in. So when you're ready to put all your new stuff in, knock your old races out first. And all I used was an aluminum chunk of aluminum. And if you look, Kind of right there, you can see a notch on both race seats. And you just bring the punch up into that notch section, hit it on one side, go to the other, hit it, just keep working back and forth. Then we'll drive the race down in there. Then we'll repeat the process with the outer race also. Make sure everything is really clean. One final wipe down of the race. Then I'll install the pinion for mock-up. So I've got the original shim that came off of this. So it should be close. And then I have a setup bearing. And it's important to use the same brand setup bearing as the actual bearing you're going to put in. There is slight differences between Timken, Koyo, and uh, National, and any of the other major brands. A little bit of lube and the crush sleeve and this is the used crush sleeve and all I did was kind of hit it with a hammer to sort of expand it back out since I'm not using this it's not that important it just needs to hold torque for setup so tightening down the pinion nut to get the correct preload on the bearings and this is just a homemade tool of mine it's just quarter inch plate steel I've got a couple different hole patterns drilled in it for different rear end types and then it's just got a long piece of one inch square tubing welded to it and nothing special, but this really helps with help holding these still. A lot of people stick two bolts in like this and then a pry bar, that thing always slips off and then you damage something, usually your skin. Tighten it down like this. And then I'm at my preload, which is right around 10 pounds since I'm on used bearings. So now I'm flipped over and I'm going to spread this case open to drop the differential in. So you take your indicator, set it in here, and this helps you to measure how far you've spread the case. Because you don't want to go too far, but you want to go far enough. So I'm going 30 thousandths. So now we're at 30 thousandths, so we'll go ahead and drop our carrier in. Alright, I got the carrier in, 
and I've been messing with the shims a little bit getting adjusted and right now I'm right around 10 thousandths backlash so I'm going to install the caps torque those down see if that changes much looks like it tightened up about a thousandth on me so I'm at eight thousandths which is on the tight side by three thousandths but that's fine. I'm going to use this to check the pattern because like I said, I got to take all this apart, change those bearings anyways. So this gets me real close and I can just see how my pattern is. The pinion shim is basically what I'm measuring right now. Okay, you going to help me out with this? Stick your paw on that and then smear it on there. No? All right, teeth are all painted up. I'll spin this guy around and check the pattern. Move you in for a close-up of this pattern we ended up with. So it looks real good. It's centered fairly well. I painted this whole surface and it smeared it off of most of the surface. You're looking for any anomalies, whether you're... I'll try to paint you a picture. So let's say we had painted up a tooth like this and we do our check and what we come back with is something like that so that is contact out here on the heel only and that's bad or say you pulled it and it looked like that that's contact on the toe and that's bad too and that's when you want to start shifting it you want to get it centered these aren't perfectly centered they're pretty close these two look real good and that could have been just the pressure from when I was holding the pinion. This one's a little bit on the toe side, but that's a good pattern. It doesn't go all the way to the edge. So I'm getting all my pressure is on the face of the gear, not off the edge of the gear. Then on the other side, our pattern looks even better. It's really centered. It's covering almost the whole face. It's not going off any of the edges. A little bit on the toe there, but I've got so much face contact here that I'm happy with that. So the pinion shim is good. So now I'll take it all back apart, pull those check bearings off, and put the real bearings on and put it all back together. Set my backlash again. Here's the setup I use for pushing the bearing on. All it is is a piece of pipe. I've got an aluminum spacer in there that just pushes on the race. That way you don't push on the cage. And that's it. Make sure your shim is under your bearing before you do this. Just like that. Now we're pressed on, ready to reassemble everything with a new new crush sleeve and a new nut for this and a new seal and a new outer bearing. So I'll get all that installed and then we'll check our backlash again. All my new parts are installed, seals installed, new nut, new bearings. Got my pinion preload set. Spec is 14 to 19 inch pounds. And it's kind of hard to tell, but I am right at 19. So I am right at the top of the spec, which is fine with me. I'd rather have it a little bit tight than a little bit loose, but still in spec. So now I'll flip this over. I've got everything put together. Got my bearings in. And I went through and I reset my backlash with everything new. So right now my backlash is right around... 13 thousandths, 13 to 14, somewhere in there. Spec on this is 11 thousandths to 16 thousandths, so I'm right in the middle. And the way you adjust your backlash if it's off, and mine was off, I was initially at 7 thousandths with the new bearings and everything, with the same shims as when I checked. So to increase your backlash, you reduce the width of this spacer, and or you increase the width of this spacer, depending on your preload on your bearings, I reduced this one around 10 thousandths, left this one, and I've still got good preload when I release the pressure off the case. So the way you shift it back and forth, the way I did it, I have a collection of stock shims, and these are all different thicknesses. Like this one's 259, 294, 282. So I just happen to have a collection of a whole bunch of these. But when you buy a complete kit you normally get a shim pack like this where it's got all different size shims in here and you can create your own two thicknesses and you can just measure and adjust all these little ones as much as you need to 
And if you look, there's a whole bunch of little, like these are all different sizes in here. Thousandth, five thousandth, ten thousandth, and then some larger ones. You want to sandwich the little ones in between two large ones when you make your own. But I just like to use the stock ones since I have them. They're easy to install. So everything's torqued down. This part's all done. Now I'm going to check my pattern again. And on this side, I've still got the same pattern where it's centered both ways. So nothing really changed. Good tooth pattern on everything. See on that side too. So all set with this. Rebuild's done. So there we go, axle's all modified. Everything's replaced that needs to be replaced. This is the stock short side. You can see about how much gap is there. And this is the modified short side. Basically the same amount exact of gap. So I don't have my brake backing plates on yet. I'm gonna put those on after this is in the truck. It's a lot easier to move these things around without those. They're, they bend easy, they get damaged, but axle's all done. Cat's outside playing with an armadillo. Cat, leave him alone. He's eating grubs and stuff. Hey cat, is that your new buddy? Huh?